So, first thing I think I need to do is just point out the elephant in the room. On this feast, we sing and speak Michael's praises and talk of what a, a great protector and archangel he is. And, and yes, he did indeed, if you read Revelation carefully, throw Satan out of heaven. But the problem is where he threw Satan. Uh, he got rid of Satan from heaven, and now we've got him. <laughs> and he's really, really mad. I'm not so sure I want to thank Michael for that quite so loudly. But we'll, we'll leave that one be for a moment. You know, we so easily dismiss any kind of literal reading of the type of material we've got today because it talks so much about things that in our modern or postmodern minds seem fantastic and mythological, like almost cute. And we sort of take a, uh, a patronizing view, perhaps, of our forebears of many centuries ago for whom this stuff was thought of as actual tangible reality. But I want to suggest that while I'm in no way against modernity, I'm in no way against science, be it some of the harder sciences or the social sciences that have given us so much information about the mechanisms that lead to the world that we inhabit and perceive. We've lost something by completely compartmentalizing and mythologizing all this talk about angels and other orders of creation and heavenly creatures. Here's why. How many of you found tuning into the news this past week to be a rather upending, perhaps anxiety-producing experience, at the very least uh, producing some consternation? Yes. Okay, well, you're, you're, you're actually a pretty mature, chilled-out congregation. I think if I'd asked that question in certain quarters, every hand would have shot up skyward. It has only been a handful of times in American history that the process of forcibly removing a president from office has proceeded as far as it did this past week. It's not just our country, though. Across the pond, Great Britain is in a sort of a parallel turmoil. There's a lot of stuff going on in Israel that's rather unprecedented. And that's just the stuff that's come to our ears. Uh, we, we have a particular attunement to those parts of the world and those parts of the world that perhaps we are ignoring are also in turmoil. And in the midst of that turmoil, when we view the world through a purely mechanistic post-enlightenment, post-modern lens, we get to a place that I think could not be more spiritually unhealthy. You hear it just walking down the street well, folks, it's very simple. The world's divided into good people and bad people, into good ideas and bad ideas, and you just need to separate those out, and the good people need to somehow, whether it is by brute force or hopefully more by the force of their words and their character, conquer the bad people, and then everything is going to be fine. Well, right away, there's a problem with that logic. I think if you take a step back for a moment, you have to acknowledge that there are some quote-unquote good people on the other side of the aisle, whichever side of whatever aisle you happen to find yourself on. So right away, that way of looking at things, there's something a little bit inaccurate about it. So now, Let's have a look at a more Judeo-Christian anthropology. See, Judeo-Christian anthropology says, no, 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 no. There's no such thing as good people and bad people. Every creature of God at the end of the six days of creation was declared by nature very good. If you're going to use any sort of judging vocabulary at all, you have no option but to use the term very good. There is no exception to that. And then elsewhere in Scripture, every creature of God has the potential to fall short of that very goodness, of that glory. There's always going to be a gap. And again, there is no exception. And 
not fair to say, it's not our business to judge whether anybody's dad is bigger or smaller than anybody else's. We're all in the same boat. And I believe that the language of angels, of these other cosmic orders of creation, can really help us spiritually get to a place where we can engage with all this stuff in a much more productive fashion. Because if we open our minds to the possibility that our human drama is not the end-all and be-all, but rather it's only a tiny portion of creation, it's only a tiny portion of the great cosmic drama that is unfolding, so much of which is invisible and inscrutable to us, maybe we can take a deep breath. St. Paul even said, our struggle is not against enemies of flesh and blood, but rather against the powers and principalities of this present darkness. In other words, all of the conflict and the strife that we see here in the human sphere is just a tiny microcosm of a much greater cosmic struggle. And that greater cosmic struggle is not between the good people and the bad people. It is between a vision of harmony, a vision of creation in which everything is perfectly dependent on God and perfectly interdependent on each other, and then a vision that is completely isolated. Every man, every woman, every angel for him or herself. That is the struggle. And that is the struggle that in a strange guise we see playing out in our human world all over the place. Well, if that's really what's going on, and there really is a mighty struggle happening between the angels who are fighting for that great vision of beautiful, harmonious interdependence of everyone and everything gathered around the throne of God and singing glory and praise, and the precise opposite of that? Well, our role in it changes dramatically. All of a sudden, we're wasting our time to try to root out and destroy the bad people and the bad ideologies. Our warfare is not a warfare of the normal kinds of weapons at all. It's instead a spiritual warfare, which I hesitate to even use the word warfare because it's more like a spiritual peace fair. And the only weapon is the weapon of prayer. It's a deep prayer motivated by a desire that will not be satisfied by anything less than perfection, that says, God, open my eyes. Give me the ability to discern what and who, in the broadest possible sense, is fighting for the heavenly vision. Help me to know how I can align myself with that striving, and then please, wherever in creation anything or anybody is working against it, please turn that heart. Please save that person. And you know what? There is so much need and demand for that kind of prayer, for that kind of spiritual warfare, that we don't have time or energy for anything else, my friends. I believe God means for that to be our 24-7 vocation. And the best news of all is no matter how daunting that task feels, think about the descriptions that Scripture gives us of our allies. If this isn't just cute mythology, but this is real stuff, this cosmic struggle is going on, we have the Archangel Michael on our side. One who is so huge, we hear in Revelation that one of his feet pretty much occupies the entire sea. Just spend a moment with that vision. That guy is on your side. And the list goes on and on. So my friends, when you leave here, if you tune into the news or you just walk out on the street and it starts